What would be the difference between an ordinary sandbox that a child might use in a playground and the sand play as you use it in therapy? Most sandboxes are usually outside, are much bigger. The child can actually sit inside them. Whereas here, a certain space is given and this space is limited to a natural field of vision. The swat is expressed within the sand play is contained within these limits. In bigger sandboxes, where the child can get inside, he may himself act as a figure within the play. But here, in the smaller box, the children express their ideas in a three-dimensional, self-contained picture. You give much importance to the fact that the working material is sand. Yes. Over the years, it became more and more important to me because I have seen that it represents an element which in our life today we don't really use anymore. That is, the element Earth. Unsere Schulen sind ja vollständig intellektuell ausgerichtet. Our schools are completely intellectually orientated. What is done for the body, such as gymnastics, is only done a few hours a week compared to so many hours of intellectual work. And so it seemed to me that the child develops in a one-sided intellectual way and many come into therapy just because they suffer from being blocked. This means that they don't have enough energies available to assimilate the material that is given them just intellectually. So, on one hand, you give importance to the element Earth. On the other hand, you also give much importance to the possibility to have an almost unlimited choice of figures. Yes, this is extremely important. For example, if we think about dreams which come from the unconscious, then there are no limits at all. The fantasy is completely free. Therefore, we try to give the child as many figures as possible in order to give him the greatest opportunity to express his fantasies. What kind of children come to see you? Many children who suffer from difficulties at school. Usually the parents only become aware that something is wrong when the children are having trouble at school. There are also many problems between the children's classmates or between brothers and sisters or between parents and children. There are, of course, many psychosomatic symptoms like asthma or headache or stomach ache and what seems to be so widespread, bedwetting. <laughs> Mm. 
Wasser Der geht nicht gut, wie sollte er sein? Sitzen? Nein, wir gehen. Der? Oder der da? Mhm. Wie sollte er aussehen? Nasse Kleider eigentlich. Nasse Kleider? Ja, das ist noch schwierig. <lacht> Wenn wir uns halt einfach das denken, vielleicht, dass er nasse Kleider hat. Mhm. Was meinst du? Ja. How would you describe the situation of the neurotic child when he comes to see you and can begin to play in the sandbox? The basis of my therapy is what I call the free and protected space. The child should be completely free to do whatever he wants. But at the same time, the space must be protected because the child and especially the insecure child doesn't know his own limits. That is, when he has an unbounded space, his behavior often goes over his limits. Oft, when ihm der freie Raum geboten wird, seine Grenzen. Ein Beispiel vielleicht, wenn ein aggressives Kind zum Beispiel ein Feuer machen könnte, for example, when an aggressive child wants to make a fire in the sand or elsewhere when we play in the garden, perhaps he might make it bigger and bigger until it is dangerous. At this moment, he needs the protection that the therapist can provide. The sandbox itself represents already the free and protected space. It's free because a very large number of figures is at the disposal of the child with which he can express whatever comes to his mind. The limitation of the space within the sandbox gives him security and he no longer goes beyond his boundaries. When you speak about limitation, how do you distinguish this limitation from a kind of authority, which is not accepted any longer as positive? The authority which is not being accepted any longer today is the one which is only authoritarian, so that the child is not free to make his own experiences. But in a way, these experiences are forced upon the child at a very young age, at two or three years, when they attend anti-authoritarian kindergartens. I feel that at that age, the child is not yet ready to make his own choice completely without the protection of a benevolent personality. After all, 
Each person has the natural limits of his own nature. The therapist must recognize these limits. The limits, of course, vary from child to child and the great task of the psychotherapist is to lead within these limits the process which is set off by the sand play. I don't know. I was going to make a desert. Ah, oh, you wanted to make a desert? It didn't and turn out I... that way. Oh, now you see, when all this, uh, it, it very often turns to be something quite different. Huh? And then uh, there's an idea. I don't even like this. You don't like that? You would have liked the desert you would have preferred? Really? But I got the idea about the pond, and there's no such pond in a desert. Yeah, well, if there's an oasis. Yeah, but it didn't seem likely that I would that I would make the one in the desert, so. Yeah. I never draw a cow or a house with dogs or a you know, well and trees and I never do that. Maybe it's time I should, I don't know. Well, who knows, yes. Maybe something is changing in you if you don't expect it. So maybe something is changing. That all of a sudden you feel you do things that uh, are different from what you expected, huh? I guess. I don't know. I just didn't think that I would do something like this. How, uh, how do you deal with unexpected situations, for instance? Huh? Not do you terribly like them? Well. Not, Not terribly well, Not huh? Terribly well. No, you see. So perhaps this is the beginning. The Ameise bear, that was not unst. What is the advantage of sand play therapy as compared with other play therapies? When the child begins to play in the sand, that is, in this sandbox, which corresponds to his field of vision, one sees at once that there, where he plays and creates his picture, he comes near to his totality. First pictures often show situations which play a role in the outer reality, but very soon symbols emerge which point to the child's inner problems. So we can see that the child, as he plays, goes more and more deeply into himself and makes an interior situation visible. The polarity between his inner and his outer world is thus revealed and is united in the sand picture. Today, Mark is almost at the end of his therapy. When he was six and a half years old, his pediatrician had sent him to begin treatment. Mark grew up in the house of his parents, who took good care of him. Nevertheless, he suffered from symptoms that are characteristic of many children of our time. He was an extremely insecure and nervous child. He couldn't sleep, he bit his fingernails, he was very timid and had difficulty in his contact with other children at kindergarten. He was very jealous of his younger brother. Mark was cross-eyed and he resented wearing glasses. In many respects, his behavior was that of a child much younger than his years. But at the same time, he was intellectually very advanced for his age, especially in mathematics. At the first session, Mark began to construct a mountain in the sandbox, which he wanted to make as high and pointed as possible. He searched for the highest trees he could find. At the top of the mountain, he put a little house. The house looks as if it might fall down at any moment. Could this be an expression of Mark's lack of a secure foundation in his own life?
does the guitar player below the house, who sits modestly half hidden in a cave, represent Marx's yet underdeveloped feeling? Marx said that this mountain belongs to a clown. He also said that the clown has a polar bear beside him. In the background, behind the bear, stands a woman. Next to her, a wrecker waits under bright lights. Has there been an accident? Does this point to a problem? A huge menacing elephant suggests another danger by the shore. On the other side, a turtle crawls out of the water, carrying its baby on its back, a symbol of instinctive motherhood. Next to an Indian sits Mark's grandfather, whom he loves very much. A cowboy with his shovel crosses the bridge leading to the mountain. Here the clown seems to await him with open arms. Can the cowboy help the clown to build a more secure foundation for his house? In this first sand picture, which Mark made at the beginning of his therapy, we can see his unbalanced development. This rich creation indicates his justified ambition, but it also shows a lack of instinctual foundation and a lack of feeling and warmth expressed in the image of the clown and the polar bear. The positive aspects in the picture are revealed in the figures on the small island. The bridge, which connects the island to the mountain, suggests a chance for change and future development. In the second picture, which the boy made a few days later, he enters a magic world. With all the available sand, he made one steep mountain and placed at the top a cathedral. This is surrounded and protected by a strange circle of Indians. The only other inhabitant of this enchanted place is a little dwarf. Here, Mark enters a secure and sacred inner world, which is, nevertheless, completely isolated. In the third picture, there comes a clash between this peaceful interior world and the conflicting elements of the exterior world. A threatening situation now surrounds the church with its protective Indians. It seems that Mark has already found within the sand play therapy an opportunity to express the conflict between his inner world and the dangers of the technical, rational world in which he lives. The boy illustrates that he has mobilized his defensive forces. Can such a situation be resolved? There might be an indication that it can be, as there is a boat which appears to be ready to leave for new shores. Indeed, when Mark came the following week into therapy, he again chose a boat. This time, the ship becomes the center of the picture. It breaks through the mountain and is free to move toward new frontiers. It looks as if he can even face a danger like a large snake, which may symbolize a primitive, instinctive force that is awakening in the boy. This force becomes stronger in the next picture, where many horses move from right to left. The horses, unlike the snake, may represent helpful, guiding instincts. Mark called this picture the path. On the path, where his grandparents walk, a horseman blocks their journey. This way, where all are going, divides into two paths in different directions. One way, the way to the right, leads towards the crucifix, but this way is blocked. The other path 
to the left is open and passes by an Indian tipi. The Indians may represent people who in their religion and way of life are close to nature. It is striking that in the following picture, nature is revealed in its full richness with wild animals and plants. These animals are being watched both from below and above. Among the wild animals, we see once more the polar bear, and next to him, the observer and the clown. Nature is separated, however, from the human beings by many fences. This reminds us of the problems of Mark and so many other children who live in this highly technical and intellectual world separated from their instincts and the natural roots of life. Here lies the essence of Mark's conflict and difficulties. A bright, highly developed mind is in opposition to an underdeveloped relationship to the physical side of nature. Although Mark showed advanced intellectual capacities for his age, he remained in many ways a little child in behavior. Once again, a path leads out of this situation, over a bridge, to a mysterious temple. In the next picture, the grandfather sits on a tomb. A very old woman is buried in it. Perhaps Mark feels his difficulties can come to an end and also be buried. Mark called his next sand play the land of the shadows. In this fairyland, so different from the bare tomb we saw before, it looks as if something new is announced. Amidst a beautiful natural setting, a stately procession moves towards a castle. In her golden coach, the queen is going to join the king. Will this union of these archetypal parents give birth to a new child? Through the children who come to you, you meet their mothers and get to know their problems. What about these problems? Many mothers have lost the ability to play. Perhaps even in their youth, they didn't play. And these mothers have to behave within certain forms. When we think that so many people live in apartments where the children have little chance to play because, for example, they may make too much noise and the neighbors might complain. And all these factors influence the mothers. They, quite unconsciously, also begin to feel unfree. Therefore, we encourage mothers to make sand pictures, and it is astonishing to see how liberated they feel. From the problems of the children, you come inevitably then to the problems of the parents. Obviously, it is often very difficult for the parents when the child comes into therapy, in so far as the child immediately experiences this free and protected space, and he feels secure and happy. Therefore, the parents have the impression that the children like the therapy because they can do whatever they want. Whereas at home, they have to follow certain rules. In therapy, of course, there are also rules, but they correspond to the child. As the parents have their ideas that things must be done in a certain way, 
these preconceived ideas may not suit the child's way of being. In therapy, the child develops and begins to enter a new world. But at home, he must continue to live with his parents, who remain as they were. Doesn't this cause a conflict? The child, when he comes to us, is usually insecure. What we try to give the child is an inner security. This inner security grows as he expresses himself regularly in this free and protected space. The goal of therapy is a security so strongly rooted in the child that even with negative influences at home or at school, he can remain secure within himself. If the parents feel that they may have made mistakes with the child, do they have guilt feelings? Of course parents often have guilt feelings. There is so much talk today about the many mistakes parents make. I try right away to take the guilt feelings away because I find it doesn't help the child at all when the parents approach him burdened with so much guilt. After all, these guilt feelings come mainly from the situation in which we live today. Our way of life has moved so far away from that which is natural and adequate for human beings that even the parents are not truly themselves anymore. And so I try to tell the parents that although it might be a fault that we establish certain rules and behave in a certain way, Actually, all of us are in a general situation which doesn't correspond anymore to nature. We should try to bring the child's life closer to his more natural possibilities. And then the parents can liberate themselves from guilt feelings. In speaking from time to time with the parents, we discuss how the child might be handled. As Mark is cross-eyed, he was put into a special school for visual training for several weeks. There, he was very unhappy. In this matter-of-fact atmosphere, characteristic of many schools, he was unable to live out his inner world as it was expressed in the last picture before he began his course of visual training. It is striking how much this negative experience at the school is reflected in the next sand picture after he returned to therapy. Everything seems static, blocked as in a desert without vegetation. The only dynamic is a horseman riding from the flag of the boy's home country towards a flag of a foreign oriental country. Very often, when Eastern symbols are chosen by a Western patient, he is looking for values still hidden and unconscious to him. This situation can be an expression of Mark's need once more to come into a closer contact with his inner world. This flag, with its moon and stars, may stand for the promised land he needs. During Mark's next hour at the sand play, something very important occurred. At first, he made a huge mountain using all of the sand. He called this the Magic Mountain. Here is the place I live, Mark said. Here also lives a little dwarf called Zipfelwitz, who has made a cave for himself where he can do magic. 
Then Mark changed his mind and destroyed this scene because Zipovitz, he said, had thought of a round, round lake. As he made this circular lake in the middle of a new landscape, Mark was intensely involved. With great care, he chose all of the blue, the green, and the transparent stones he could find, because, he said, these are so beautiful. One by one, he carefully put them into a perfect circle, and on this lovely lake, he put a pair of sea lions and their young. This closed circle is a perfect expression of the total person, the self. During the process, then, there is a moment which we can call the manifestation of the self. Yes, I would say that with the manifestation of the self and the realization that the ego is but a part of this whole, begins the transformation of the psychic energies. This is represented in the following pictures, mainly through the world of plants and animals. That is, here we are concerned with the instincts and drives, which at the beginning still may be dark forces. During this phase of development, there is a transformation. The destructive forces become constructive. So many wild horses. Did the miner ever catch a horse? Or does, is this not his business? He can catch them, but he can't. He can? <coughs> mm -hmm. They can catch them when they want. Mm -hmm. Oh, whoever wants a horse can catch one? Yes. Because they don't belong to anybody? No, they're wild. <coughs> see, they caught this, he caught this horse and trained it. I see. So maybe he's going for another one. Yes. When does the formation of the ego begin? I would say definitely that it begins after the manifestation of the self, where it is first represented in animals, corresponding to the animal level in us. Only afterwards, human beings become more important again in the sand pictures. Kommen wieder Menschen in den Bildern vor? Supplies of food and sand, hmm. different things. Different things that you need? Yes, and some things that he'll sell at market. Oh, I see. So he's going to the market. Yes. And maybe the donkey helps him to carry all those things. Hmm? Mm -hmm. so the sparkle of the sunshine, and here too, huh? Mm -hmm. Here we have a sparkle of the sunshine, and there, yeah. That's beautiful. Maybe he wants to make a poem on the uh, mine. Yeah. In the beautiful country, is the sparkle of the sunshine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the appearance of the animal vegetative level after the manifestation of the self can also be seen in Mark's series. After his last picture of the round lake, Mark created a long procession of wild animals, formerly fenced in, but now walking freely. As in so many fairy tales, when man has developed a good relationship to animals, the animals become helpful. Here, for the first time, he put a round mirror, which reminds us 
of the round lake. The clown, who in the beginning had just one polar bear beside him, now welcomes all of the animals together with the cowboy who has the strength to deal with them. This suggests that Mark from now on will be able to face and control his instincts. The clown is again in the next sand picture, but with him as central figure is Zipfelwitz, the little dwarf. He lives under a mountain where he makes magic and, as Mark said, automatically creates music. The clown and the little dwarf are no longer isolated as they were in the beginning of the therapy. Zipfelwitz leaves the mountain once a year. He knows the clown. Every year he visits him and, in return, the clown goes to visit the dwarf. Once again, there is a horse and rider who symbolize a relationship between man and his instincts. The lack of relationship to his instincts was, as we have seen, one of Marx's central problems, the interrelationship of body and mind, or of the spiritual and material world, is now evolving. Mark expressed this growth in several sand pictures, as, for instance, here, where the horse rider is the connecting messenger between two couples, a priest with a woman on one side and a toreador with his lady on the other. In Mark's daily life, this new connection became apparent. His behavior was decidedly less nervous and less inhibited. He began patiently to create handwork, which he had never been able to do before. Mark made another picture with Zipfelwitz. Though hidden behind the woods and separated by a moat, the dwarf, as Mark says, receives visitors, but only those he can enjoy. He has a mirror with which he can do magic. He also has his church, which is buried in the mountain, and only the spire of it shows. He sings in the church, and he is the best singer in the world. While before, the church has been almost out of reach on the top of a mountain, it now actually is within the earth. The dwarf looks at himself in the mirror and becomes aware of his own existence. Now we see that Zipfelwitz is on a mountain standing next to his solidly based house, which can be reached by a road. This became a very important moment because Marx said, Zipfelwitz, of course, that's me. Thus Marx consciously revealed his identification with the dwarf. Marx now constructed what he called a magic mountain. He said that Zipfelwitz was the chief who did not have to obey anyone and could go wherever he wished. The greatest secret is that he can do magic, Mark said, and can create anything out of nothing. Zipfelwitz now enters many activities. Here, he is a farmer. This corresponds to Mark's growing self-confidence in life. So, when a neurotic child, at the age of five or six or eight years, comes to see you, what really happens in the process when there is a kind of regression and a reformation of the ego? What is important is that in the beginning a regression takes place or a kind of diving into deeper levels of the unconscious where the negative aspects of the faulty ego development are expressed. Therefore, we have seen that only after the manifestation of the totality, which is the basis of a new development, the ego begins to develop again in a positive way. 
in einer positiven Weise zu entwickeln, nämlich in diesem This Sinne, means it does not dominate anymore, since the ego is the center only of the conscious mind, whereas the self in which the ego is contained represents the totality of the personality, both the conscious and the unconscious of man. At what age does the development of the ego normally begin? My opinion is that the normal ego development takes place between the age of two and four, when, after the manifestation of the self, the phase of rebellion usually begins. It is the moment when the child calls himself I and no longer speaks in the third person. Und jetzt geht er noch mal, oder denke ich noch mal etwas aus? Ja. Ja. Das schon wieder. How should the parents behave during this phase of rebellion, which is so important for the ego development of the child? Parents very often cannot understand this behavior. The child may be very obedient and happy until he enters this rebellious phase. The parents want the child to be the same as before, but this would mean that the child could not develop his own independent personality. He must experience this independence upon and against the outer world. 
Therefore, he continuously says no, because his ego begins to assert itself. The ego must make its own experiences. So, Mark also is now ready to make his own experiences. During an important following hour, he put Zipfelwitz on one mountain and opposite it, the grandfather on another. Mark said he chose the grandfather to represent the therapist. We notice it is not Zipfelwitz who needs a fence, but the grandfather who is surrounded by one. This expresses a growing detachment from the analyst. It looks as if Mark has the strength to confront the world more freely by himself. How does this further development show itself in the process of the sand pictures. After the animal vegetative phase, the human beings begin to be more important. We can conclude from this that the child has related to the world of instincts and now builds up his personality. Slowly the pictures begin to move toward situations of the outer world. Often the child then wants to make creative work, as the creative forces have been awakened and enable the child to be constructive and productive. This means that he can approach life from a new angle, and very often this is the moment where the child can leave the therapy. As he can now, in life, apply and try out these new forces, he is more independent of influences, also negative influences, and he is more open in relating to other people. I would say that the child who in therapy has very profoundly experienced the free and sheltered space can carry the experience of this space into life. He has become now himself this free and sheltered space and can move freely in the world. 